Hi everybody, it's Miss Hamill here with your 10th video, your 11th unit. This unit focuses on ecology. So we have a lot of goals. So the level of organization in ecology starts out with an organism, which is an individual species in a species. A population is going to be a group of the same species in the same area. So that would be all of the squirrels living in this forest. A community is going to be groups of many different populations living in the same area. So the squirrels, the hawks, the ants, the pigeons, students, the trees, etc. An ecosystem is going to be the interaction between organisms and their environment. So it's going to be the abiotic factors, which are the non-living factors, such as water, sunlight, soil, and its interactions with the living things, the biotic factors, such as the plants and the squirrels that live in that area. A biomes are going to be a group of similar ecosystems with similar climates, plants, and animals. Um, their examples would be deserts, rainforests, and grasslands. We'll talk more about them <coughs> at the end of this uh, unit. And finally, biosphere, which is all the biomes, the plants, the animals on our planet. So essentially, it's all life on Earth. So food chains and food webs are going to be very important. It's going to be the interaction of organisms and the transfer of energy. So um, food webs and food chains are not really about who eats who, but it's where the energy comes from. So who gets energy from who? So food chains show one simple relationship in an ecosystem. So it's going to be linear. And food webs are gonna show many different relationships, so many different feeding relationships. Now the arrows are going to point towards the organisms that are getting the food. And the amount of energy is going to decrease as we go up the food web, and we'll see that in a moment as well. So the trophic levels are going to basically be the different levels within a food chain. We have our producers. They are going to be autotrophs at the bottom. They are going to make their own food. So these are going to be photosynthetic or chemosynthetic organisms. These are at the bottom of the food chain, and they contain the most energy. They have the most available energy. Then we have our primary consumers. Those are going to be the herbivores, so they are going to eat the producers. Then we have our secondary consumers. Those are going to be the organisms that eat our herbivores. They get their energy from the herbivores. And then we have our tertiary consumers, which are going to get their energy from the um, organisms below. It also can get organisms from the plant. So they could be omnivores. And basically, they're at the top of the food chain. We also have um, quaternary consumers, and this is basically top-level consumers, such as us. So in the ecological pyramids and in the food webs, it's really the transfer of energy. So as we go up the food web, the amount of energy available decreases. So at the bottom, the producers have the most energy. And as you go up, only 10% of that available energy is going to be transferred. The rest of that energy is going to be lost as heat through metabolism. So they also show biomass, and that is the amount of available food or organisms in that level, in that terrific level. So there are more producers than there are herbivores. There are more herbivores than there are carnivores, and there are more primary carnivores than top carnivores. So what is the difference between a decomposer and a scavenger? Well, scavengers are going to be omnivores and they can steal food um, because they're usually too weak to kill for themselves. They're going to eat the food with them, their mouth. They are consumers. And an example would be a vulture, worms, ants, even um, raccoons. So they will steal food. They'll pretty much eat whatever is available, mostly food that is dead already. And then a decomposer are going to secrete enzymes into the food and then they're going to absorb that food through their cell wall. And then they'll recycle the nutrients back into the soil. So they make fresh, healthy, nutritious soil that new plants and organisms can grow from. So fungi and bacteria would be an example of a decomposer. And fungi are heterotrophs because they consume, they have to consume nutrients from other things. 
Now our biogeochemical cycles are going to be the cycling of nutrients through our atmosphere and through our earth. And basically, um, organisms need to recycle, um, get their nutrients, the air, the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, everything is cycled through the environment and used and reused. So there are carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, oxygen, sulfur, and water. They're all recycled. And the basic steps to any cycle is the plants absorb nutrients from the soil, such as nitrogen and sulfur, or the air, they get their carbon dioxide. We get our oxygen from the, the air. The animals are going to eat the plants, so we get our sugar from the plants through the process of cellular respiration. We're breaking down our glucose and we're creating energy. When the animal dies or poops, defecates, and respire, those nutrients are going to turn back into the soil and the ground or into the atmosphere. So it's just a constant cycling of nutrients from one part of the environment to another, from one organism to the next. It helps maintain balance and homeostasis. Now we are going to talk about succession, which is basically when um, we develop a forest either from a brand new barren area or an area that once had life and then the life was destroyed and then the life is growing back. So primary succession is going to occur um, in an environment where there has been no life before. This might happen on a rock, it might happen on a new volcanic island. And the pioneer species are going to be the first species that inhabit that area, and they are likely going to be lichen or moss. So these are small, um, small photosynthetic organisms that are going to be the first ones that inhabit that area. And then from there, we'll have new organisms grow. Secondary succession is going to happen whenever the environment has a disturbance. So there was once a forest, there was a forest fire, or somebody cut down the trees to build a farm, or um, there was a huge storm and it wiped out a part of the forest. After the disturbance, then new species will come in and then over time, hundreds of years, we will get a, um, a climax species, a climax forest, which is uh, old trees, old growth trees. And the first species, the pioneer species to occur after secondary succession would be um, weeds and grasses. And then from weeds and grasses, we'd have small flowers then bushes and small trees and evergreen trees than our big old oak trees, deciduous trees. So populations, this is another important factor, and populations are going to grow depending on the availability of resources. So if a population has unlimited resources, such as food, water, shelter, things that they need to survive, they're going to grow exponentially, which that means they're going to grow and grow and grow and have an exponential or a J curve. Our selected organisms, such as insects or bacteria, are going to grow exponentially like so. Eventually, limiting factors or factors that are going to limit the population, such as food, water, and shelter, are going to slow the growth of the population because as the populations grow, resources become limited, and as resources become limited, the population will decline. And the population um, that occur at this level is called a K-selected. So these are organisms like ourselves, um, an elephant, etc. They need their resources in order to survive. So populations may oscillate at carrying capacity, capacity or at around carrying capacity, which is going to be the number of organisms that can be supported by an environment. So here in this model right here, we have our carrying capacity. So what is the carrying capacity of this population? Well, we would look here and it is about 1.5 million. So it's where it begins to level off. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about here are the different biomes in our planet, on our planet. So we have our tropical rainforest, and 
first off, biomes are going to be in areas around the world that have similar climate, plants, and animals. So the first one, again, are tropical rainforests. They are warm all year round. They get a lot of precipitation, rain. Obviously, they're called rainforests for a reason. They have layered forests, big trees with big leaves to uh, capture a lot of sunlight. And the seeds are adapted to basically be eaten by organisms, pooped out, and then plants will grow again. The trees um, are going to inhabit or be a home for many different organisms, such as monkeys, um, sh different whoops, monkeys or sloths. Organisms are going to want to live in the trees. A lot of insects are going to be adapted for the trees as well. The deserts are going to have high temperatures and low precipitation, very little water. And the plants are going to be adapted for the small amount of water. So they have to have the ability to absorb and store water, such as cactus. The organisms, the animals, are going to have large ears to dissipate heat. They are going to be burrs or nocturnal to help keep them cool. So some examples would be reptiles, coyotes, and jackrabbits. Our grasslands, we have two different types of grasslands. We have our savanna, which are found in Africa, and our prairies, which are found in the United States. They have high temperatures, moderate precipitation in the savanna, gets more rainfall than prairies, and they're often fires. So they have tall grasses, few trees are going to be found near water sources. And organisms that live there are going to be grazing animals, or animals that like to eat the grass. Okay, the next one is our temperate deciduous forest. These are going to be moderate in temperature with moderate precipitation. They have big trees that lose their leaves in the winter to conserve water, such as oak and hickory trees and maple trees. And the leaves change color in the fall. Um, organisms are going to hibernate. Animals will hibernate in the winter. They'd be in dull colors to blend in with their environment, such as deer, raccoon, squirrels, and snakes. The taiga or coniferous forests are going to have long, cold winters, short summers. They have evergreen trees or carnivorous trees, which basically would be like our um, Christmas trees or pine trees. They have wax on their needle to prevent uh, water loss, and they keep their leaves all year round. They have shallow roofs, and the trees are shaped in a triangle. And we have the animals that live in this area will have broad hooves to walk on the snow. They have thick, thick fur or blubber, such as moves, elk, wolverines, and then of course there are insects as well. And last but not least, we have our tundra, which is long, cold winters, short, cool summers, small plants to prevent water loss. The, they're going to grow cold, low to the ground to keep uh, warm. Lots of lichen and moss and small flowering plants. Again, our animals are going to have broad foot, hooves to walk on the snow, thick blubber, hibernate. These animals would be polar bears, caribou, reindeer, and seals. And of course, we do have um, aquatic biomes, and the aquatic biomes and the aquatic ecosystems, of course, those would be ones found in water, they are really going to be um, adapt, the organisms in those areas are going to be adapted to the amount of light. So organisms that live deep in the ocean are going to be adapted to have little to no sunlight, where those who live in the shallower water or warmer water will be adapted to having lots of sunlight. And phytoplankton is going to be the base of the food chain in our oceans. Okay, so that is the 10th video. We have about two more. We have uh, plants and animals to get through. So good luck studying and a couple more days till the EOC.